Hello and welcome back to Forensic Bytes. Today I wanted to talk about a relatively recent push towards manufacturing opiates without any need for growing poppies. What we're going to cover is opium, what it is and what it isn't, as well as how it's made. We'll touch upon the breadth and scope of the legal and illegal opiate industries before transitioning to a newish fermentation route to create opiates directly from sugar whereas previously they've been grown and harvested from opium poppies. And finally, we'll try gazing into the crystal ball and discuss whether or not this opium poppy-free route to generate opiates could be made commercially viable in the near future. But first, some nomenclature. Opiate and opioid are two terms that sometimes get used interchangeably, but they have set definitions. An opiate is something that is extracted from opium, which comes from poppies whereas opioid is a chemical that mimics the natural substances that you would extract from the opium plant. This makes opioids largely synthetic or made through some sort of chemical transformation route. Good examples of opiates which you can extract directly from the opium poppy are morphine, codeine and thebane, whereas fentanyl and heroin are types of opioid. These are synthetic, either entirely or made by a chemical transformation using one of those initial opiates as a starting material. But neither can be extracted from the opium poppy. So in terms of the basics of opium, what you need is to grow a crop of opium poppies. They will flower, and once they've flowered, they will start to generate a seed pod. This unripe seed pod, so before it's dried out, can be scored with a knife, and this white milk substance, better known as latex, is what contains the opiate drugs. Now, if anyone's a J.R.R. Martin fan, you've probably read about Milk of the Poppy. It probably relates to this latex material. But in reality, the latex is collected and dried out. When that happens, it oxidizes into this dark brown red color. If you take this dried out latex and dissolve it up in alcohol, what you get is laudanum or tincture of opium. This is what it looks like, and this is what would have been drank historically. So while it looks like milk at this stage, in reality, this is what the drink laudanum actually looks like. Now, there's a drawback to this whole opium material from the perspective of someone wanting to feel the effects of morphine or codeine. So given that it's whole opium, it contains several other alkaloid chemicals within it, and they can have an adverse effect on the person ingesting it. One such example is thebane whose main effect on the body is to cause vomiting. And this actually is often accurately covered in books and literature. If you need pain relief, you take laudanum, but if you drink a lot of laudanum, it makes you quite unwell. And this comes from the chemicals other than morphine and codeine within the opium. So for these reasons, opium usually isn't the final step. It's generally extracted to eliminate some of the unwanted chemicals within it. This process isn't super clean, the extraction isn't targeted specifically to chemicals like morphine and codeine. You get other chemicals as well, such as thebane, papaverine, and noscopene. Looking at the table, you can see two subspecies of the opium poppy. The one on the left is more of a wild type of poppy, which has relatively modest amounts of morphine and codeine with low levels of thebane and some byproducts as well. While the Somniferum, this is more of a genetically modified variant or a, a kind of poppy that's been bred to have higher amounts of desirable drug products within it. So as you can see, the morphine and codeine levels are higher. The thebane is also considerably higher. And this is because the pharmaceutical industry uses thebane as its precursor for making different kinds of opioid drugs. That said, the two analytical techniques are actually different. So we've got electrophoresis and HPLC. So we're kind of comparing apples and oranges in terms of the amounts of materials you can extract from the two subspecies. But takeaway message, the GM variant contains a much higher level of usable opiate materials, either in the final form, like morphine and codeine, or in a precursor form like thebane that is used for opioid synthesis. Now, it should go without saying that opiates are big business. So if we take a look at the World Health Organization model list of essential medicines, this is basically an overview of all the drugs that a country would need to deliver healthcare services. There are two opiates listed, those being morphine and codeine, the same ones grown inside of poppies, 
and their use falls under medicines for pain and palliative care, essentially the strong pain relief that you would get in hospital. Interestingly, fentanyl is also listed in the report, but its use is for more drastic measures such as end-of-life care to make someone comfortable before the end. So in terms of legitimate market share, the global market for morphine alone is about 15.2 billion US dollars in 2022. Now, there is a large illegitimate market for illicit drugs also, and whenever we're talking about illegitimate opiates, we're generally talking about Afghanistan, where most of the world's illicit opium production takes place, probably closer to 90%, with Myanmar generating the final 10%. This illegal production is probably worth in the vicinity of 2 to 3 billion US dollars in 2021, with most of the opium being converted to the opioid heroin. So for every 7 kilograms of opium, you can do a chemical conversion to give you 1 kilogram of heroin at the end. This raises its potency and makes it more fast acting by being able to cross the blood brain barrier more quickly. Essentially, it's an easy value-adding step that can be done to make more profits. So looking over here at the map of Afghanistan, wherever you see this pink colour, this is where fields of poppies are being grown for opiate production. And as you can see, it's displacing wheat as a crop, meaning you essentially need good farmland if you're going to farm poppies. And the climate zone that you would grow it is equally well suited to growing wheat. So what that means is the illegal growth of opiates can put pressure on the world's food supplies, particularly at the moment when we've got global uncertainty and war in the Ukraine, where most of the world's wheat is produced. Now, in terms of where this illegal opiate and opioid drugs are being sent, so we've got the Myanmar 10% production over here, we've got the 90% Afghan production down here, we've got the original opium amount here, and we've got the conversion to heroin here. In terms of Myanmar opium, any that's converted to heroin is mostly being sent to China, with lesser amounts to India and the rest of Asia, which also makes use of a large amount of the unrefined opium with India. Afghan opiates for unrefined opium, this is going to the Middle East largely, as well as Iran, with refined heroin being sent more to Africa, the Americas, Europe, Russia, as well as Iran and Pakistan. Breaking down total consumption, China, Iran, the Russian Federation and Europe are the major destinations for the illicit opiate drug trade. Going back to the legitimate producers of opiates, we've just seen that it requires large fields of poppies to be grown and that those fields could be used for other productive crops like wheat. But some other things to consider are that poppies have an optimal climactic zone, but per the World Health Organization report, Every country requires opiates for its healthcare system, which puts some countries at a disadvantage if they can't generate their own supply. However, those that do generate their own crops of opium poppies, they have their own problems. So the crop itself is hazardous, particularly the genetically modified versions of the crop. Here's a typical sign that you would see in Tasmania here in Australia where they grow poppies. And there's been deaths of several backpackers who would go in and take these seed pods and then try to brew them up into a tea to get a free dose of the morphine and codeine. What they don't realise though is that the genetically modified crops have relatively low levels of these opiates and higher levels of thebane, the intermediate used to create opioid pharmaceuticals. Thebane is really useful for this, but it's toxic to humans. So the tea drinkers get a large dose of this and often die as a result. Similarly, by weight, most of the mass that you grow of poppies is waste. So you extract a relatively small quantity, and then you have all of this leftover material. The waste is full of alkaloid chemicals, so you can't really feed it to livestock because it's toxic to them as well. And what all of this has meant is that scientists have been searching for an alternate way to create these opiate drugs. And about 10 years ago, a scientific study identified fermentation as a possible way of generating opiates without the need to grow these large crops of poppies. It began as a collaboration between Stanford University and the US Drug Enforcement Agency to create a pilot study to simply see if it was possible. Now, I work in a university, and one thing we typically do not see is a collaboration between a government drug enforcement agency at least not for this kind of research. 
However, there needed to be lots of checks and balances in place for fairly obvious reasons. So the basics of the idea are that you can take yeast and modify its genome such that it can take sugar and chemically convert it to hydrocodone and thebane. Now, you'll note that it is not creating morphine and codeine. I expect that's one of the checks and balances. They didn't want to have a genetically modified organism that can directly create these opioid drugs. So they halted it at the precursor thebane, which the pharmaceutical industry would use to then create their own opioids. Now, the benefits of this should be pretty obvious. If you set up a fermentation plant, you can do it pretty much anywhere in any country. So all the limitations that apply to growing opium poppies are removed. All you would need is to import sugar and have access to this modified version of yeast, which can convert the sugar to the opiate. Now, I'm a chemist. I'm not a biologist, so I'm not going to go into deep about this. But here you can see we have sugar and we have this transformational pathway going through all of these key steps, which eventually lands down here on the bane. The way I perhaps naively think that this will be done is that the full genome of yeast will be known. And being an important crop, the full genome of the opium poppy plant has probably also been sequenced. Once you know the full genome, it then becomes a problem of identifying the correct genes that are going to code for all the enzymes that do these chemical transformations, turning sugar stepwise into each of these intermediates along the sequence. Now, this is not going to be easy. Yeast is a fungus, the opium poppy is not a fungus, and it's not as simple as taking a gene from one, putting it in the other, and everything works out okay. Genes code for enzymes, which create chemicals, and if that chemical happens to be toxic to the yeast, creating that chemical is going to kill off your yeast. Similarly, within yeast's own genome, there's going to be many, many genes that code for all the things that it needs to reproduce and survive. If you disrupt those genes, the yeast is also going to die. So it's a case of preserving all the genes that the yeast requires to live while imparting the genes needed to do all of these chemical transformations hopefully not poisoning the yeast as you do so. So not easy would be quite the understatement in terms of doing this research. So simplistically, we have sugar. It gets transformed all the way to this amino acid, L-tyrosine. And from the sugar and the L-tyrosine, we get these two intermediates. You then have multiple transformation steps, and this gets us down to thebane. The point is shown down here. Once you have the thebane, this would get extracted or simply excreted from the yeast, collected, sent to pharmaceutical companies, and they would do the final transformations on it. And while it wasn't easy, the researchers were successful. They were able to take this genetically modified yeast, grow it in a medium containing sugar, and at the end, get back hydrocodone and thebane. But to throw some cold water over this, it was entirely proof of concept. It was designed to see whether or not it was possible not to do it in a commercially viable way. So the amount you would actually need to make this a commercially viable enterprise that could compete with growing poppies is you would need about five grams of hydrocodone or thebane per litre of fermentation solution. What they were able to achieve is one microgram per litre, but this was direct from sugar. So to give you just some idea of how little that is, I'm pretty sure one microgram per litre is a millionth of a gram. So if you require five grams per litre, you are a millionth of the way there based on what you need. To get a single dose of Vicodin, that means you would need thousands upon thousands of litres of sugar water to ferment one dose. However, to quote the authors, substantially improved production of opioids via yeast should be expected in the next several years. And they made that quote about 10 years ago now. And to give you an indication of progress, the very next year there was a similar idea, not using yeast, using E. coli as their genetically modified organism. They were able to produce opiates from glycerol at yields of 2.1 milligrams per litre, which is a 300-fold increase. And to put that into perspective, another increase of that amount would get you approximately to the point of the approach being viable. 
So this update came in 2016, one year later, and there haven't really been any updates since then. That could mean one of two things. Firstly, a dead end. They haven't been able to improve it any more since then. But the alternative is that they have increased it up to the point that it's become viable. And when that happens, commercialization will kick in and they will stop providing information that could essentially inform competitors to their process. So it's quite possible that this fermentation route to opiates has progressed significantly further in the last eight or so years. That's all we have for today. Thanks for listening.